from the mountainous ancient kingdom of Wallachia in what is now modern Romania. A man emerged who would excel himself in devising innovative methods of torture and mass murder. He had life, power of life and death over all of his subjects. He inspired a marvelous horror story and it's an unusual horror story in that it was real. In a bloody six-year reign, the ruler of this kingdom brought terror to citizens and foreigners alike. Prince Vlad Dracula was more than just the inspiration for the bloodthirsty vampire of legend. To this day, he's still referred to as Vlad Tepes, Vlad the Impaler, in memory of his favorite method of killing. From his birth in 1431, Vlad's home of Wallachia was racked with instability and unrest. Wallachia in the 15th century was a small and backward principality. It faced two great powers, the Ottoman Empire to the south of the Danube and then the Kingdom of Hungary to the west. So the scene was set for a conflict between the two great powers and it was in between these powers that the story of Vlad unfolds. As son of the Prince of Wallachia, Vlad was initiated into the Christian Order of the Dragon, a select group of European royalty dedicated to crusading against the infidel Turks and defending an empire in the name of the cross. The Ottoman Turks, they were the most successful fighters for Islam in the 15th century. Nobody could rival them in terms of spreading the religion. As head of the order, his father was known as Drakul, meaning the dragon. Vlad was very proud of the fact that his father got this very select honor so he called himself Dracula, which means son of him who had the order of the dragon. In 1442, the Turkish invasion of Transylvania left Wallachia vulnerable to its Hungarian enemies. With his throne under threat, Vlad's father made a deal with the Ottoman Sultan. Wallachia went through a series of rulers rather rapidly and it was in the interests of the Ottoman Sultan to keep them under control. They didn't try to overrun and conquer the land, they tried instead to extract tribute from the Valachs and to demand troops from them if they needed them for their army. To seal the deal, Vlad's father sent his two young sons as tribute to the Sultan in Adrianople right into the lion's den. You had to leave an insurance policy. And the best insurance in this case was to leave your two sons on the premise that you wouldn't dare go to war and risk the lives of your sons. But as a matter of fact, the father did and knew what he was doing. We have a letter from the father to the citizens of Transyl the town in Transylvania saying, how can you doubt my convictions? I've sacrificed my own sons in the Christian cause. Vlad was 13 and a hostage in a strange land. You have to think about this for a moment. Look, you're a young boy, your father leaves you, you're bereft of your mother, mother goes back with the father. You're among these Turks. You don't know Turkish. You don't know Islam. You're a Christian. I mean, it's a strange place, it's weird religion. It definitely has affected him as a teenager. It could not have not affected his way of thinking. He had this hatred very much imprinted in him and, and this desire of revenge. Vlad's growing sense of abandonment and betrayal spawned a severe hatred for the Sultan and his court. The Sultan's eye was fixed firmly on Vlad and Radu as potential puppet rulers. 
they were being primed to take their native throne in the name of Islam. But Vlad was studying the enemy and biding his time. The most important thing was probably military, and I suspect that Vlad and Radul would have had a good military training in the Ottoman court. They would learn about warfare, particularly riding, how to fire a bow, swordsmanship, uh, because being a member of the ruling class, which is what they were destined to become, meant also that you had to fight on the battlefield and indeed you had to lead armies. And having learnt that, then they would have to learn the rudiments of Islam. It was here that Vlad witnessed the fear-inducing effect of public execution. Generally, executions were, were fairly public because the whole purpose of them was to show the power of the Sultan and also to encourage people not to step out of line. Unlike Vlad, Radu had become fully indoctrinated into Ottoman culture and its army. His younger brother has given in to the Sultan and gone over to the Sultan and becomes a minion, a puppet. Vlad's motive primarily is to stop Islam and to maintain the independence as far as he could of his native Valachia. He wanted to be ruler. His brother really accepted the Turkish way of life. He wasn't interested in war. Radu was not. He was interested in just being a prince and being pampered and leading the easy life. For Vlad, that was unthinkable. He had a fight, he had a motive, he was driven and this was not something he could accept. So the relationship between him and his brother was, was terrible. To Vlad, Radu was a traitor, never to be trusted again. In 1448, Vlad's father was murdered by the power-hungry Valachian nobility in a plot to take the throne. After six long years in exile, Vlad's chance to rule had finally come. The Turks raised their army and put Vlad at the helm. He was to be the Sultan's new prince of Wallachia. But within three years, Vlad had turned on the Sultan and had thrown him out of what was now his realm. Barely 25 years old, Prince Vlad Dracula began his infamous and bloody reign. He came back to a country that was unstable. He had no idea who was for him, who was against him, who would help him, who would defy him. At first it appears he was a popular ruler because he seemed to be independent, which was something they hadn't seen in a long time. Once in power, Prince Vlad increased security by building thick battlements, watchtowers and underground tunnels. Vlad Sepesh really changed the way Valahia looked by building a whole set of new fortresses, of using new key points that he reinforced. He knew he was on the brink of war with the Turks, that was clear. He was preparing then his country. To the new prince, Valachia was now a war state. Once prevention of foreign attack was completed, he turned to ensuring the loyalty of the nobility. He assembles all the boyars, the nobles, to a great feast. And he wined and dined them. Ironically asked them how many rulers they had seen in their lifetime. And many, some of them mentioned 12, I mean, a large number of princes who had been on that throne. And what did this show to him? That they had no respect for the prince. And then afterwards, when they little suspected it, he had the place surrounded. He took them on a death march to his mountain lair, Castle Dracula at Poyanar. And made them work side by side, elbow to elbow, with the peasants to rebuild and reinforce the Poyanari castle. And many of them fell from the rock, from the just a thousand foot drop on all sides. It's a precarious sort of place. 
Many died from exhaustion and from lack of proper nourishment, but soon turned from being, let's say, a man who was apparently at first relatively popular to someone who was feared.